All right. Hello, SLOCOM. Uh, good to be back. I am Sal Kimmick, and today I'm going to be talking about culture clash between DevOps, site reliability, and cybersecurity. And this is really how this is going to go today. I'm going to talk about what we can learn from SRE best practices, what's going on in the new realm of open source cybersecurity, and how we can take what we've learned how to do in SRE and really use that to understand the new wave of cybersecurity and how we might create an immune system around that. And this mean time to update is a really good metric that you're going to be able to use in order to do that. So... In order to do this for SLO Comp, I'm trying to do this in seven minutes, so we're going to see where we get. But uh, if I'm talking about monitoring in this case, I really am talking just about the quantification of the system itself, just looking at the dashboard metrics. But if I'm talking about observability, it's something a little bit different, a little bit more nuanced. It's taking a set selection or clusters of things that I'm monitoring in order to get a proxy of the behavior of a system over time. One thing to understand is that all of these things are subject to the law of thermodynamics. They are forms of software, which is sitting on hardware, which is sitting on servers. So there's going to be problems that occur. And another thing we have to consider now which makes this a really good reason to take some of those practices from SRE to cybersecurity is that these attacks are coming in and producing a new form of decay. So observability done well is just the signal processing of the state of a system that will continuously change with use and decay over time. So this new wave of cybersecurity attacks is vast. It comes from every single ecosystem. I'm just going to show you a few of the most recent events in just 2022 alone. We just got through the first quarter, and this doesn't even include last week's. Um, it's important to understand that we've seen an incredible acceleration in cybersecurity attacks. And uh, whether you're a hobbyist or an enterprise engineer, this is impacting you today. <laughs> But the common language across all developers, especially in the sort of dashboard age of understanding our systems, is statistics. Now, if we're looking at signal processing in this case, a good statistic is going to be an effect of interest over an effect of variance. We want the effect of interest to be as big as possible, the effect of the error variance to be as small as possible. The statistics that we find important in a site reliability engineering format, where we're able to tie the true behavior of architecture to business intelligence, are these three things. So I'll we'll have an SLI stating that something should be true, so that something should be available, for example, a service level objective for a percentage of time, and an SLA, an agreement that states if this is not met for that percentage of time, that there may be legal uh consequences to that, that you may need to inform or engage with your client, customer, or your end user. Now in SRE, these are always uh, tied to real forms of time. So if you have a common uh, site uh, system service level objective of 99.95 .95 availability, for example, that would be in a month about 22 minutes of downtime available before you lose the error budget. So your error budget is just very simply a way to understand that the systems that we use are inherently and by the laws of thermodynamics unstable. We have a way to track that in a way that allows us to allow for tolerance of that. We can take that philosophy over into understanding cybersecurity moving forward. So if you want to use the best practices of SREs, you're really using a way to tie those together as a composite SLO to tell a story behind how your system is behaving and why. And you should be able to automate, a monitor, and evolve these. So every quarter you should be going through and checking to see, are the proxies that I'm using, are the elements that I'm using to understand the behavior of my system, what really makes sense, especially if we're moving this into new, do new domains. We know for SRE that availability and latency are important. What are we gonna do for cybersecurity? I've got some good ideas. So MTTR is incredibly important. This is your mean time to remediation. So we do understand that this is after a major incident. How long does it take us to get to normal standing? How long does it take us to go through due process? And do we have everything fixed, fixed at the end? Did we not just put a patch in? Do we have a true architectural solve to this moving forward. This becomes important when we're looking at things like making right versioning choices. Can you not move to a new version? Um, so 
your MTTR is important, it's essential you probably are already recording it. This is one element to a two-part dashboard that I would love for you to try to take an SRE approach to cybersecurity. Because most of the problems that we're having in cybersecurity come from the open source supply chain. When I discuss this, it looks like this sort of four-part method. You're typically going to be pulling in open source packages in from an open source repository. Think Maven for Java or PyPy or PyPI for Python. Then you're going to bring those in, refactor them, use them in a way that makes sense for your own application and logic. That's going to be your source code. Then you're typically going to containerize this. And then if you're using best practices, you're going to use infrastructure as code to be able to scale this when and as needed in a way that makes sense. Now, I work at Sonatype, and I'm in a pretty interesting position working with them to be able to see the behavior of open source over time, because they were one of the first companies to focus on putting security wrapped around a repository, around the Maven Central repository. So I've got decades of information now on how open source uh, packages are maintained, how individual teams and uh, developers take in those packages and use them as they evolve. And it's fascinating because the statistics on this are getting really interesting. 90% of modern application components are open source, which you can also flip to think about nine out of 10 of the developers who made your application are not on your payroll and aren't in your standups. And a lot of those developers are unpaid volunteers. This is just true at this moment in time, although this may be changing. So all modern digital infrastructure is built on these things that are generally held up by volunteers, maybe two or three if you're lucky on a project. Now, the use of these projects is increasing in every single ecosystem that we have. So almost 100% increase. So twice the number of downloads in Python, 50% in JavaScript. This isn't slowing down. And we're just seeing an explosion of human creativity using logic as code, as a poetry for code. I think that we're going to see some really interesting things coming out of these ecosystems in the next two to five years. Just an explosion of humans communicating and bringing together new things just based out of PRs. Um, so this is going to be fascinating to watch, but a really small percentage of those individuals have done so with bad intentions. So when I show you this 650% year over year increase in the next generation of cyber, uh, cyber crime attacks, yes, this is true, but I think it really it pales in comparison to the human progress that we're making as well. Now, if you think that you're immune from this because you're using well-maintained projects, I just want to make a note here that you're probably not. Uh, they make a point to hit the most active projects uh, because those are the ones that are most likely to get them the highest surface area. They might be as likely to hit a bunch of hobbyists as they are a large enterprise or a mid enterprise. The most amount of cybersecurity attacks actually hit the mid to small enterprise businesses. I'm not going to go into the details about Log4j. You've probably heard of it if you have an interest in cybersecurity at all. But I just want to remind us how easy it was, this little string down below, how easy it is in this case to exploit this vulnerability and to insert an executing code inside of it that only you may be aware of. Um, it was the, sort of the beauty and simplicity of Log4j that made it something so interesting to study and understand because there was a culture clash here uh, that I think a lot of people missed. So develop, developers really wanna know in an incident like this, how hard is it gonna be to upgrade? What's our new path? Operation wants to know where it's running. Security wants to know how to mitigate it from a zero day. Legal wants to know if there's any legal ramification, what's been breached, what do they have to publicly acknowledge? And Double wants to know where in the cybersecurity, uh, cyber the software delivery life cycle, this is all uh, downloaded and running. Um, now, I think that those motivations traditionally ha has made sense for those to be separate. But when we're looking at a situation like the new cybercrime or cybersecurity attacks, where it really hits day after day and you see a level of fatigue, you need to think of ways to quantify your risk in a way that everyone can be aware of. Because if not, we're seeing the downloads for Log4j continue to be vulnerable. People are downloading bad versions, either the original one or ones where they stopped paying attention to this still being a problem, and it still is. Um, and this is a problem. I just want to make a statement here. It's a problem for every single continent and country. There's variable 
uh, response every time there is a new update. But the maintainers of that project have done really well to make sure that it is no longer vulnerable. This is a problem because we saw very similar behavior from the general global public uh, to this during Struts. So Struts was announced months before the major and very, very infamous Equifax breach. Um, we're probably going to see very similar things in Log4j, and there's just no reason for this. If you go through, go and scan your own architecture, see if it's sitting in your jars and Uber jars, perhaps, um, and make sure that you pull it out because this could still be an issue. And this is the kind of reason why they're using these insidious attacks, um, because those are much more convenient than sort of the front door attacks that they used to do. But in order to be immune from these, you have to start thinking differently. You can still do macro architectural decisions. That's the very traditional model of saying, hey, this is the way that my architecture fits together and the API is between them. But now you also need to make micro dependency decisions. You need to understand how likely, how often you're going to have to update your packages and if they're still going to work together. But if you want to do that well, if that sounds complicated, I can make that easier for you because we've got a metric that's really interesting. So you can use something called the mean time to update. So what this is, is looking at the dependencies of a given component. Um, then what we want to do is calculate the time between when that version was released and when it releases another version of that with those dependencies updated. So really showing the hygiene of an open source component or package that you're trying to bring in, and we're computing the average of those against all those dependencies. So you can have the health of your system can be its own mean time to update, and you can also calculate the uh, mean time to update health of any components that you bring in. But this is why I need you to have just a two number dashboard in order to understand the entire open source life cycle that you are intaking, consuming, and then outputting as your product as well. If you are holding on to your mean time to remedy, if you also hold on to that mean time to update, you can actually see a direct uh, correlation between them. So your mean time to update strongly correlates to your project's mean time to remediate, which makes a lot of sense. So that means the open source projects that you metabolize has a direct and positive impact on the output and your ability to cure your system if it has some kind of bruise or abrasion from either cybersecurity attack or some other kind of outage. So this isn't limited to just cybersecurity outages. This is overall time to remediation is always positively impacted by a good mean time to update on average for what you're intaking, which is just very, very cool. And it means that we can have this just two metrics that we track to have that end-to-end -end understanding of your architecture. It's behaving over time. When we're talking about behavior over time, your mean time to update is already uh, going up for every major open source package. So it used to be that they would update maybe once a year. Now they'll update about once a month and we don't see this slowing down. So what this means is that you might need to be updating more often for your standard packages anyway. It's good to have quantification in place to know which ones are the best choices to make. So this is my argument to you. I hope I was able to do it pretty quickly. Automate, monitor, and evolve. So tell that composite story with SLOs. And if you want to get that end-to-end -end product view using open source lifecycle as your reasoning for why your system might be able to not just be repaired quickly, but also observed more easily because you put more careful telemetry in place, look at your mean time to update and your mean time to remediation. My last quick note here is if you want to play with this and really make it fun, you can install a free forever open source tool called Sonotype Lift, which is a very interesting way to go and look at those projects where you really depend on them and you need them to be secure in their cybersecurity. You can install Lift on their packages or have the maintainer install Lift, and you can ensure that you make a quick backlog of all the cybersecurity risks that may be currently occurring. But more interesting moving forward, it's a get clean, stay clean method, which means every time a PR is made on that open source package moving forward, then you're going to be aware of any cybersecurity concerns before they even originally get put into an open source uh, package, which I think is just a very cool uh, moving far left approach in cybersecurity that really allows us to have a peace of mind across the whole system. 
So if you're interested in any of these statistics, a lot of these came today from the State of the Software Supply Chain Report 2021. Go check out that vulnerability supply chain for all of the new information. There are a couple of vulnerability resource centers for specific vulnerabilities ongoing as well. So Log4j or the uh, Shell4j. Uh, latest event. Um, and if you want to try uh, Sonotype Lift, you can go to lift.sonotype.com slash get started. If you're curious about any of this, if you want to help me with a bug bash, for example, which is the way that we gamify uh, doing cybersecurity campaigns, reach out to me at Twitter, particularly at Kimmich underscore compute. I would love to be in touch. Thank you, SLO Conf, and thank you everyone for watching. Have a good one. Thank you.